So welcoming everybody officially to uh, the Venom and the Serum. <laughs> uh, this is actually uh, the name of a course given by Sheikh Ammar al-Shukri uh, for Al-Maghrib Institute or at Al-Maghrib Institute. And I subconsciously <laughs> chose that title based on that course while completely forgetting uh, that that course existed. Because the naming of that course by Sheikh Ammar was a discussion between me and him maybe five, ten years ago. Uh, and the content is somewhat the same. And it is based on the book of Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, a book by Ibn al-Qayyim, may Allah have mercy on his soul, called Adda' wa dawa the disease and the cure. So he didn't like the word disease and the cure, so he called it the venom and the serum to make it more uh, dramatically appealing. And I liked it. <laughs> and I completely forgot the class existed and that we had that conversation and I suggested it for this program. But who is Ibn al-Qayyim first of all? Let's jump there. Ibn al-Qayyim, may Allah have mercy on him, is one of the standout scholars uh, in Islamic history. He passed away in 751, 751 years after the Hijrah, the migration of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So 751 on the Islamic calendar, which correlates to 1350 exactly on the Gregorian uh, Common Era ca calendar. Ibn al-Qayyim was the most notable student of Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, whose biography we covered a bit months prior. And he was a a master of many disciplines. He was a, uh, an expert grammarian. He actually wrote his own commentary on al fiyat ibn Malik, which is uh, probably the most famous manual on Arabic grammar uh, that is taught far and wide historically. He has his own commentary written on it. He's a master theologian. He wrote books like Asa'aq al-Mursala and Jifa'u al-Alil. Uh, He's a, an expert of the Hanbali Madhab, Hanbali uh, Islamic law, but he is most famously known for being a master spiritualist, <laughs> a uh, expert and specialist in Islamic spirituality, in Tazkiyah or Tasawwuf or Suluk. All of these three names historically have been interchangeable. Uh, and he wrote more books than I can sort of even list out for you here and now. The most famous of them, though, uh, the greatest of all his books in his, the entire Ibn al-Qayyim library is known as Madarij al-Salikin. It's called The Ranks of the Divine Seekers and 100 Stations of Spiritual Refinement. And alhamdulillah, Dr. Uh, Ovamir Anjum uh, has begun and even the first volume has already been printed on the translation of Madarij al-Salikin, worth having for anyone uh, interested in the subject. Uh, and his second most famous book on spirituality is the book we're covering now, just to bring it full circle, which is Adda' wa Dawa, The Disease and the Cure. And so this will, inshallah, be an attempt to summarize those hundreds of pages in 10 or 15 classes, bi'idhnillah. The objective is a deep dive into spiritual illness, the realities of a sinful lifestyle and un-Islamic lifestyle, uh, distance from the straight path in general, people that are being tossed essentially between doubts and desires away from the straight path of Allah Azza wa Jal in terms of their, their belief and their actions, the very real risks of that, and the road to recovery. And as like a, an ancillary or a secondary benefit that you will automatically get, you will taste and reinforce through tasting firsthand real scholarship. <laughs> confidence uh, in the scholarly process and methodology that our scholars uh, adopted because that is important as well. And to be honest, the book, he never named the book Adda' wa Dawa, The Disease and the Cure. That's just the short version that is, it's most famously known as. But the book is actually called Al-Jawab Al-Kafi Liman Sa'ala Ani Dawa Al-Shafi. You can hear the poetic rhyme there, right? Al-Jawab Al-Kafi means the sufficient response, the satisfying re response to, or answer for the one who asked a question about where is the curative or curing remedy. 
That's what it is. Why? Because at the very beginning of the book, he is asked a question. And so he writes these hundreds of page, pages as a response to a single question <laughs> that he was asked by somebody. And I will read that question to you and try to cover the preface of his answer today, which is about 100 pages. I'll crunch that into today's session before we move on to the other segments of the book. So he presents the question and that sins are a disease and how are we to understand diseases and cures and the number one thing you need is to understand how dua works before I even explain to you anything. You have to understand how to speak to Allah before I speak to you and you speak to me. And then he speaks about two key ingredients to being able to escape a life of sin, to escape your infection, being infected by a sinful lifestyle. All of that we'll try to cover today. And then he gets into sin as a venom, sin as a poison that is destructive. All of the harms of sin in this world and the next is like three, four hundred pages. We'll take that one uh, one step at a time, inshallah ta'ala. So first and foremost, the question, what prompted this write-up? Uh, he was asked verbatim, Bismillah, and he prays, the person prays for the scholars in general, and he says, what do the esteemed, esteemed scholars and vanguards of Allah's religion, may Allah be pleased with them all, say about a man who has been afflicted so severely and is certain that if this continues, it will destroy his life and his afterlife. And this person has attempted everything in order to resist it, resist this affliction. And its intensity and blaze only increase. So how can they escape this? And can this even be cured? Can this even be remedied? So that's the question. And the whole book will be based on this question. He will speak about how to remedy yourself from a sinful lifestyle, right? Rahimahullah. And he will actually spend the second half of the book speaking of other very particular type of sins that it seems from his uh, sense, his sixth sense, that he believes the questioner is indirectly referring to, which is basically being stuck in haram relationships, being addicted to those kinds of sins and everything connected to them. Okay? So he'll speak about the intro we will discuss now and then the harms of sins no matter what they are and their punishments in this world and the next. And then he's going to double click or double down on that particular sin uh, that he feels the question is referring to. Okay, so how does he begin? He begins in a very prophetic way, which is what? Give the believers hope. That's the prophetic way, right? The Prophet ﷺ said to us that the man came at the end of the, the long account. He said, I committed a hundred murders. Can I be forgiven? The scholar said to him, why not? Why wouldn't someone like you be forgiven? However, here's the process. And so same thing, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, the very first thing he begins with, he says, all oh, praise be to Allah, we know that it has been confirmed that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ مِن دَائِنْ إِلَّا وَأَنزَلَ لَهُ شِفَاء Allah has never sent down a disease except that he sent down for it a cure. This is a hadith, clearly authentic in Sahih al-Bukhari. And there are other wordings of it as well that he includes there. He says in one narration, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam even added, Whoever knows it, knows it, and whoever doesn't, doesn't. Meaning, don't think that just because you don't know it means it can't be discovered. All sins have a cure that can be discovered. In a third narration of Imam Ahmad and Tirmidhi and others, he added, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this encompasses every disease, every disease, illa al hiram except old age. That's the only thing that can't be cured. Mortality. We are all mortals. When old age comes, you have to fall apart. When death comes, you have to respond to the caller. And in one fourth and final narration, in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said, there is for every disease a remedy, and once the remedy lands on the disease, it is cured by Allah's permission. Then he goes on to say, and this is a universal principle that applies to every disease, the diseases of the heart, the diseases of the soul, the diseases of the mind, the diseases of the body. Where do you get this from? The scholarly process, right? He said, we know from one incident, Sunnah Abi Dawood, famous hadith of Jabir, 
the Prophet وسلم, said to the men who killed somebody, basically, by giving them misinformation, Allah, may Allah ruin them, they cost this guy his life. Why didn't they just ask if they didn't know the answer? He said the cure for ignorance is to simply ask a question. Which means even, it's not just the medical illness that all these ahadith are talking about. Even the illness of ignorance, even the illness of arrogance, all of that can be cured, it's included. And he said spiritual diseases as well. Because in the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jal said, about the Qur'an, in the Qur'an, بَلْ هُوَ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Rather, this Qur'an is for, it provides for those who believe in it, hudan wa shifa, guidance and a cure. So that means we've added now through these different texts to the medical, physical illness. We've added the intellectual illness of ignorance, right? It's a defect. And likewise, the spiritual illness, the Qur'an cures that as well. Cures the doubts, cures the desires, cures the ignorance as well. And then he says we have another proof, which is Surah Al-Fatiha. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explicitly called Surah Al-Fatiha a ruqya, a shifa, a, a spoken cure. Something that can cure simply by being recited upon it. Then he mentions an interesting story, Rahimahullah, Ibn Al-Qayyim himself, the author. He says, and I remember when I was one time visiting Mecca. And I became incredibly ill. And none of the doctors could help me. And I continued to treat myself using Surah Al-Fatiha and found incredible impact, incredible power of by reciting Surah Al-Fatiha upon my ailments over and over and over again. He said, and since that day, I would never find anyone troubled with an illness except that I would start with them and prescribe before anything else, Surah Al-Fatiha. So that's the first segment of the preface. He's telling him it's all curable. Don't lose hope. The disease is curable. Then he goes on to say, speak about at considerable length, the power of dua. He says, and dhikr, the remembrance of Allah, and dua, supplicating to Allah, speaking to him, and the verses of the Quran in general, are incredibly powerful to remedy oneself, incredibly beneficial. He says, but there's more to it, right? He said the efficacy, the effectiveness of, of dua requires a few things. Number one, he says, look how consistent he is. I just, very impressive. He says the suitability of the landing site. Does this medicine belong here or belong elsewhere, right? The suitability of the landing site. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with the resolve of the one making dua. He says, and it's just like the body. He draws a parallel with like physical illness. He says, the body, if you take the wrong medicine, that's already one form of failure with the medicine. Th this is not the type of medicine you need, wrong prescription. He says, or the medicine could be taken in a way, here's a second possibility, right medicine taken in a way that will fail you, a way that's ineffective. You know, like they say the guy, the doctor said to the guy in the, in the joke, uh, why did you take the antibiotics at 6 o'clock and I told you to take them at 9 o'clock? He said, I wanted to catch the, the, the disease off guard. <laughs> no, please just follow the label, right? Follow the instructions. He goes, sometimes people can take medicine in a way that will not actually deliver it, the medicine, to the right places, right? In the right ways. He says, and the third one is that you could be taking the right medicine, right? For your illness. And uh, at the right time, but the application itself is weak. The application itself is weak. How you take it uh, could be compromised, meaning don't take this medicine along with dairy, right? A hindrance, that sort of thing. Or don't take it without dairy, or whatever they're going to say, uh, the experts. He says, and so now apply that concept of physical illness and physical medicines. He says, apply it to dua. 
He says some du'a are just weak. They're ineffective du'a, like the du'a that is hated by Allah Azza wa Jal. Uh, du'a that involves shirk, right? That involves calling upon Allah by calling upon one of his creation, right? Or hated by Allah in terms of what you're asking. Oh Allah, destroy my family. No, <laughs> that's a weak du'a, not going to work. You don't want it to work. Oh Allah, take my life. These sorts of things generally are hated by Allah Azza wa Jal. So the du'a itself could be defective. And then he says, number two, sometimes the, the heart from which the dua is emanating could also be weak. And he gives the example of you trying to use a bow, but the bow string itself is it's not tight. So the arrow will not get very far. Likewise, you're making the right dua. You're saying it the right way. It is objectively or inherently a good wording to say but you're saying it from a heart that is absent, weak, doubtful, this sort of thing. Then he says, and there could be weak application of the dua, meaning you're saying the right way and you're really confident in Allah, but you've, you've taken dairy with it. <laughs> what dairy? You've committed oppression, right? You have haram income. You, so you're hindering, preventing the acceptance of your dua. Make sense? The, the lifestyle you have. So you need to have a resolve to clean up your life, seek forgiveness before you make your request, this sort of thing. And he gives some examples from the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam to these points that he's making. Of them is that in one hadith, the Prophet wasallam made it clear to us, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَقْبَلُ الدُّعَاءَ مِنْ قَلْبٍ غَافِلٍ لَهِ Allah does not accept the prayer that comes from a heart that is heedless and distracted. Lip service. And in another hadith in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned, this was uh, reported by Abu Hurair radiallahu an, Ar-Rajul yutilu safar, a man who's traveling for a long time, ash'atha aghbar, he's dusty and disheveled, unkempt, right? Yarfa'u uh, yadayhi ila sama he's extending his hands to the skies, يَقُولُ يَا رَبِّ يَا رَبِّ Saying, my Lord, my Lord. But his food is haram, his drink is haram, his clothing is haram, and he's nourished by the haram, the unlawful, the impermissible, right? The Prophet ﷺ said, فَأَنَّا يُسْتَجَابُ لَهُ How can or when can this person get responded to? This doesn't mean Allah will never respond to his dua, because Allah may respond, may respond to the prayer of a disbeliever altogether, not just a disobedient person. But it sort of lessens the likelihood, the efficacy of your dua so considerably. And that's why he said, when? When do you expect this to get answered? And he mentions uh, from Imam Ahmad in his book, Az zuhd that one time the Israelites, Banu Israel, were suffering greatly one time. Like they were short on water or whatever it is. It was a famine or something of this nature. They were suffering greatly. And so they all came out in one place in the middle of the desert, right? To show their desperation to Allah, meaning. You know, what is the point of the traveler? This does hands raised, saying my, all of that are expressions of humility, which help your dua. But in that earlier hadith, you had things holding back your dua. So in this narration, Banu Israel went out to the desert to show Allah Azza wa Jal their desperation. Uh, and they started raising uh, their hands saying, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, please, oh Allah, don't let us die. Please don't let us die. Save us. And Allah revealed to the prophet of that era, whatever generation that was, Allah revealed to the prophet of that era, tell them, go tell your people, you emerge, you come out of your cities to me, you emerge with impure bodies. Right? You're not uh, protecting your bodies from impurities, whether sexual impurities, whether, you know, uh, urination or otherwise that sort of invalidates the prayer. You, you come with impure bodies, raising hands that you've spilled each other's blood with. You guys are violent with each other, ruthless with each other. You're raising hands that you've spilled blood with and that you filled your houses with impermissible possessions with, the haram stuff you brought home. Uh, and then you expect me to respond when you raise your hands? And also, Imam Ahmad also narrates in a zuhd uh, a very uh, beautiful statement by Abu Dharr, the great companion, radiallahu anhu, about this concept. Abu Dharr said, 
the amount of dua needed with righteousness is the amount of salt needed for food. What does that mean? It's not meant to be cryptic, but translating it into English is cryptic. <laughs> what does it mean? The majority of your food is salt? The opposite. That's exactly what he's saying. Umair. Give this guy three Michelin stars. <laughs> the same way all you need is a little bit of salt to make the whole dish flavorful. Just a little bit of righteousness. Just respect God a little bit and you get all the du'a you want. That's the idea. You can't just do, live as a rebel and then say, Ya Allah, I'm your servant, you know, help me out. It doesn't work. A little bit of righteousness, pull yourself together a little bit and then you'll find your, your du'a start being accepted. And so ultimately, he, he begins with a lot of this and, he, and so much more that I'm summarizing. And then he goes on to mention that the Prophet ﷺ told us, made it clear to us, that the dua is silahul mu'min. Some narrations he calls it silahul mu'min. Uh, is the weapon of the believer. So you think this is what, you're at war now with your sins, your crimes, your lifestyle. Uh, all these afflictions you're talking about. Begin with dua, but know that it's a weapon. The weapon sometimes will repel the, the attack. Sometimes it'll weaken the attack. Right or wrong? It depends. Depends on what? How well you wield your weapon. Right? That's the uh, sharpest sword in the world. Too heavy to pick up. What's it going to do for me? I, I can't handle it. I don't know how to lift it. And so he goes on to mention now some of the ways and the factors that strengthen our dua for us. He says, number one, pleading in dua. Because the Prophet ﷺ told us, Allah loves al-mulihin, al-ilhah, for someone to be incessant in their dua, to repeat, to repeat. That shows your neediness. That's one adab, etiquette of dua. Number two, he says to be patient with your dua. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, one of you will get their response so long as they don't get hasty. And hastiness is, the hadith continues to say, hastiness is for you to say, دعوتو دعوتو فلم يستجب لي ويستحسر. For you to say, I made dua, I made dua, I didn't get any answer, so you quit. So you quit. And so this is of the signs of faulty conviction. So be pleading in dua, number one. Being patient on your dua, not just one occasion, you repeated it three times, didn't work. No, patient with your dua is number two. He says number three is to be prophetic in your dua. All the other sunan, right? Pick the right timings, like sujood and last hour of Jumu'ah and the end of the night, uh, Hajj Umrah, right? Ramadan. Uh, so sunnah in terms of the timings. Sunnah in terms of the wordings. There's no better way to speak to Allah than the way the prophets and messengers spoke to him. Than the ways he spelled out for us in Quranic dua is to speak to him. And then he mentions, and this is so cool because it's not just nowadays. It shows you uh, how people are. He says, this is really a gem. He says, after he got to the point on wordings and mentioned all the different wordings we find in the Quran and Sunnah. He says, and it is so common. He said, there's, a, there's an important point here you don't want to miss. He said, it's so common for people to hear that someone else's dua got accepted and they jump to ask that person what wording they used. Right? You cling to the wording as if it's just about the wording. He said when it was actually not the wording, but it was the de desperation and conviction and prior good deeds of the person who said those words. So the, the onlooker thinks it was because of the words, the phrasing, when in reality the secret was something else. By the way, this is from the great mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal. That he didn't make speaking to him or getting close to him a riddle. There's no like passcode that you got to figure out. Right? It's, oh, what's the secret word? There's no secret word. There, these are the best words. But more important than them is your state before and during speaking to Allah Azza wa Jal, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he goes on for an, another reflection on dua and says so many people don't make dua because they think it's pointless. 
He says, some people are brazen enough to say that. Like, what's the point? Allah already knows what I need, things like this. <laughs> he goes, other people uh, have more faith and have more sort of glorification of Allah than to admit it. But still, they just say, you know, like, if Allah wants to save me, he's going to save me. If Allah wants to help me, he's going to help me. He's saying, and they are incapable of recalling. And this is part of the, the, the illness. It, it leads to doubt, Right. That this world, we're told explicitly, Quran and Sunnah, is built on cause and effect. Allah created that effects as results of causes. And it's all destined. So he says, for example, the same way Allah destined that you be full with food. Right? You're not just going to be full without food. Both of those are destined by Allah. Yes, if Allah wants to make you full, he can make you full. But if he wants to make you full, he's going to destine that you eat to get full. Both the cause and effect come from Allah Azza wa Jal. And so to say the result, if Allah wants to give it, He's going to give it. And then you don't do your part. You have to seek out the, the cause for it as well. And he says the same way you will not be full without food. And you will not have a child without intercourse. And you will not get your trees without planting your seeds. And the same way you will not enter paradise without deeds. You will not get a response to your dua unless you're making dua. Got it? It's just the way it works cause and effect and the most valuable cause and resource that Allah destined is the dua. And then he narrates the famous narration from Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu wherein he said, I don't worry about the response. What I worry about is the dua. If I'm inspired to make dua, then the response will come along with it. It's very profound. I don't sit there worrying about when and how, if it's going to get responded to. I worry about am I making dua? If I'm guided to make dua, if I'm inspired by Allah to seek those means, to plant those seeds, to pursue those resources in dua, then I know that the one who guided me to do that wants to respond to me, wants to answer me. The last part we will cover here now, after he mentions now curable, then the power of dua and some major misconceptions people have about dua, then he goes on to say, and there are two key ingredients to surviving the dark of the dunya, to surviving an evil life, to surviving sinful, sinful habits. He says the first of them, and he mentioned it somewhat in brief, knowing in detail what causes the best and worst outcomes. What does he mean by this? He, he means developing insight like having, developing, refreshing, growing your clarity through the Quran and Sunnah, through studying world history, nations, individuals, with the lens of Quran and Sunnah, right? To realize uh, that sins are the cause of every evil in this world and not just the next, right? So what he means is connecting things correctly, the correct worldview in detail, this results in that. This is why this nation fell. This is why that nation fell, right? Allah said, whoever does this, like to basically front and center your counter. You know, the, like we speak about with such certainty that, you know, uh, sorry for putting you on the spot, Mursim, but like uh, when Brother Mursim tells his patients that, uh, you know, there's certain factors to your physical health. There's no way around it. Your strength, your power, your sort of, uh, your, your cardio, your VO2 max, right? Your, your flexibility. It's not a riddle. If you work on these, you're healthier. You live longer, right? It, it, it's the, to be that sure, to become an expert, he's saying, this is one of the best ways to climb out of this. You have to give enough time to learn with depth what sins lead to has to be like that. And this is a great, by the way, culture to develop in Masajid. Like to be aware of spiritual illnesses, all the different kinds and what they look like and what they lead to and what their signs are. You know, during COVID, everyone knew about it, right? When, when Amr said to me, no, he never said this to me, <laughs> that I lost my sense of taste, right? We all know what he means. It means he got COVID, Right? It just became sort of so rehearsed amongst us that it's second nature to us. This is what he's saying. He's saying of the most beneficial things, key ingredients to climbing out of this 
is the same way someone who wants to have like, you know, health, understands what health looks like. You want to lose weight, you know how to count calories. You want to be physically fit, you know what that looks like and how to reach it. You want to be spiritually alive and attain salvation. You got to know what that looks like. And you've got to be able to see the world through that lens. Does that make sense? Knowing in detail the causes and of the best and worst outcomes. The second of the two key ingredients he mentions, and this is the one he spends maybe upwards of 40 pages on. He says, vigilance to be awake and alert, to not be complacent, about falling delusional. You know, delusional, like, because if you have the first ingredient, I know I'm an expert in spirituality, right? But I'm only good at applying it to everyone else but myself. And, and he spends 40 pages on this why. Because the human sort of soul, when it's not healthy, it's like an, you can drown in it. It's an ocean of excuses and justifications and sort of <laughs> cop-outs. and It gives you a gazillion reasons. We have an amazing talent of, for putting our guard down, saying we're okay. So he says number two key ingredient, you got to fight to stay awake and realize that we're not talking about someone else. We're talking about me or potentially me always. Vigilance, he says, about be, uh, being delusional, having faulty hopes, being casual about one's survival. He says, and people jump from one form of complacency to another. He goes, so you can find a person one time saying Allah can forgive anything. And then another time saying, you know what, I really need to seek forgiveness for that one. So they, uh, they seek forgiveness, but only in the form of lip service. And then a third time, they say, you know, I mess up, but who doesn't mess up? And they start focusing on the amount of Islamic knowledge they have or some selective act of devotion they picked instead of other ones, right? At least I do this. At least I do that. And doesn't everyone do this? Like if, if you're sort of slacking in prayer, you say, at least I pray Jummah. Some people don't even pray Jummah, right? And if you start slacking in Jummah, you say, at least I pray Eid. Some people don't even come for Eid. It's, an, it's a bottomless pit, he's saying. You got to stay above. You got to keep your head <laughs> above, the, above the surface about this issue. And then he goes on to different groups, classes of people historically that have made major blunders in this regard. They have sort of uh, formed uh, infrastructure inside of them to be delusional. He says one group said, faith is in the heart, irrespective of how morally weak you are. That's actually a, a sect in Islam that says no matter, no matter what you do, faith is in here. Isn't that, doesn't that sound very familiar? You don't know what's in my heart? This, this is grave misguidance, grave deviance. A whole group of people and then others who are not sort of officially aware of the group, but they ideologically align with it. He says that's one group. He says another group overplays the concept of loving the righteous. He says, so they, they're, they're so confident because they love the, the, the people of spirituality. The fuqara here, he means sort of the spiritualists, the people of tasawwuf and tizki and otherwise. Or they love the scholars, or they love the righteous. He goes, and you'll find them at times even like overstepping to the point where they will go and sort of like start wiping on the graves and speaking to the people in the graves instead of more so than they speak to Allah Azza wa Jalla. But the point is, they sort of, they've told themselves, I'm all right unconsciously. I'm all right. I have a middleman. You know that idea of like, I, I know somebody on the inside. I'm okay. <laughs> this is the whole danger. I can do, and this is by the way, I, I don't mean of course, a'udhu billah, to conflate Muslim with non-Muslim, but this is a whole class of humanity. There are entire religions based on the fact that someone else will account for my sins. Someone else has died for my sins. Someone else will get me a pass on the day of judgment. And is that a reality? For some people, Allah will permit it. But he has to be in approval of that person that will be interceded for, right? Not just the person interceding. He's the third group of people. They just imagine that they enjoy some distinct status with Allah Azza wa Jal because of one deed they've done or another or one relative they have or another. Uh, and a fourth group says to themselves, you know, Allah will not hold anything against me because Allah is not harmed by sins and he's the most generous and I'm most needy 
and he's the most generous. And so they have this delusional way of misreading into some of Allah's names and not others. He says, and then a fourth group is a person, a, a group that <laughs> is an expert on misunderstanding the verses of hope in the Quran. They don't balance out hope and fear. So for example, he says, he says some people say that Allah Azza wa Jal said, your Lord will continue to give you, O Muhammad, until you are pleased. And the Prophet Muhammad will never be pleased with anyone ever going to the fire. That's not exactly what the ayah means. It can't be. Ibn al-Qayyim says, rather, the Prophet Muhammad will only be pleased with the things that please Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And we know that. He's not just assuming this. Uh, when... When we are told that the Prophet ﷺ will intercede for countless people, unimaginable people will benefit from his shafa'ah, from his intercession. May we be of them. Say ameen. Some people will be brought to him and the angels will pull them away and he'll say, wait, wait, my people. And then in the end of it, he'll say what? Take them away, take them away. He will concede to Allah Azza justice in that regard. He says, and some people, for example, that's one ayah, right? Your Lord will give you until you, you are pleased. He says, you know, how can that be when you're committing major sins and the Prophet wasallam also said to us that the five prayers and Umrah to Umrah and Ramadan to Ramadan will get you forgiven for what's between them if the major sins are avoided. If the major sins are... So the greatest good deeds still require you to leave those major sins to get forgiven. He also said that, alayhi salatu wasalam. And then he says, some people will misread the hadith about Allah is whatever you assume of him. He says, does someone actually, his response, he says, does someone actually assume good of Allah when they run away from Allah? Your, your behavior says that you assume Allah will make you miserable if you obey him. Allah will make you wait on rewards if you obey him. So is a rebel that runs from Allah and defies him openly. Someone who's actually assuming good of Allah? No, he's not. He says, does a person, very profound, he says, does a person disobey Allah night and day and then assume that Allah is going to give him the same status as Abu Bakr and Umar in paradise? Is that a good assumption of Allah? If a person in this world equated between, you know, the golden citizen and the criminal, we would look down on him being unfair. So how can we assume that of Allah Azza wa Is that a good assumption of Allah? And so he tries to shake people off these false sense of securities. And he even quotes the, the hadith of, uh, <coughs> of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when uh, in his final illness, he was very concerned about some coins of charity that remained in his house that he never got to distribute. Because it was being cycled through him. He never consumed any of it. Alayhi salatu was salam. And then every time he would ask his wife Aisha, did you give them out yet? Did you give them out yet? She would say, no, Ya Rasulullah, I was tending to you. She was taking care of him, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So preoccupied with that. Until the end of the hadith, he said to her, oh Aisha, what, does, what should Muhammad expect of his Lord if he meets him while still holding on to these? While these are still in his possession. So Ibn al-Qayyim sort of extrapolates from that hadith and he says, and what should the committer of major sins think if, of Allah if he meets Allah while these enormities are still in his possession? He hasn't repented from them yet. And then he went on to spend about easily 25, 30 pages speaking about many of the horrors of death and the grave and the day of judgment that are supposed to serve as a reason for us to not get too secure to really stay vigilant, to want to fix our life. And he quotes that, because he recognizes it's extremely scary. It, uh, and he quotes that a group of people once went to Al-Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah, and they said, to, they were complaining about someone, a scholar, scaring them too much. <laughs> he knew, he knew like, that this is very heavy language. And he said, they said to Al-Hassan, what do you say about a man who scares us until our hearts are about to fly away. He's always given us descriptions of the hellfire and the grave and people scratching their faces and people being bitten by this and roasted in that. And he says people are scaring us, a person who scares us to the point that 
like we're, we're catching panic attacks almost, right? Like our hearts are about to fly away. What do we do with this? So, of course, I don't mean literally panic attacks, right? We want productive fear. We don't want paralyzing fear. He said to them in response, I swear by Allah, for you to accompany people, for you to stay in the company of people that scare you until you reach safety is better than you accompanying people that give you a false sense of security until the horrors reach you. Right or wrong? I'd rather the doctor give it to me straight. Right? And then he quotes Abu, Abu al-Wafa ibn Aqil rahimahullah as saying, Beware, O Muslim, and don't get delusional. For he, Allah, has cut the hand over three dirhams. In other words, a certain amount of money is no longer negligible. If you steal it, you can get your hand cut in Islamic law, right? Who, who ordained that the hand get cut? He did. It's as if he's saying that the one who permitted or sanctioned cutting a hand for stealing three dirham, don't feel too secure that he will not cut off something else, right? In the hereafter. He says, don't get delusional for he has cut the hand over three dirham. And he has flogged, meaning his legislated whipping, he has flogged for a pin drop of wine, right? It's not about amount of wine. You get caught deliberately drinking wine, there would be flogging potentially involved, right? He says, and a woman has entered the hellfire over a single cat. Don't we know the hadith? The woman did not feed the cat, trapped the cat until the cat died. She entered the hellfire because of it. He goes, and a woman has entered the hellfire over a single cat. He said, and a single shirt engulfed in flames upon the person wearing it because he had misappropriated it, despite him being martyred. There's a hadith of a man who wanted this particular shirt that was left over by the other army so bad, so bad, that he took it without permission before the spoils were gathered and evenly distributed among the fighters. The Prophet Sallallahu said, I have seen that shirt engulf in flames upon him in the hereafter despite him having died in that battle after he took the shirt. And so finally, he quotes, uh, this is attributed to some of the Sahaba, but some uh, scholars say this is actually attributed to the Prophet Sallallahu himself. But the concept is very true, and it's in all, in, all throughout the Quran, it's repeated, where he said, reportedly, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when you see Allah giving a person, despite their crimes, the crimes of that person, know that he is leading them on gradually to their doom. This is like throughout the Quran also, right? Allah says, when they forgot everything, when they turned a blind eye and deliberately forgot, meaning all the warnings, we opened up all the doors for them. They distracted themselves from my warnings. Here are some more distractions. Here are some happy distractions. Here's, you know, a promotion here and an asset there and, you know, some good news here and a thrill there. We open up the gates of everything, Allah says, until they rejoice. Rejoice here means delusionally. They get delusional about this world. <laughs> we take them all of a sudden until they get taken back to Allah ultimately off guard. He says, <clears throat> and so Allah, and he, I'll con this is the conclusion now, Allah has made it very clear that we got to put in the work if we really hope for his mercy. That was the whole point. Where did he make it very clear? In the Quran. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَالَّذِينَ هَاجَرُوا وَجَاهَدُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أُولَٰئِكَ رَجُونَ رَحْمَةَ اللَّهِ Those who have believed and migrated in the path of Allah, and fought, you gotta put up a fight, man. And fought in the path of Allah, these are those who hope in His mercy. And the other verse says, Inna rahmat Allahi qaribun min al muhsinin. The mercy of Allah is near to the doer of good. Work has to be done. He says, and if your hope in Allah is true, or your hope in anything is true, if you're actually hopeful for something, three components must exist. Remember this. He says there must be a desire for it. That's number one. He says there must be a fear of missing out on it. You know, because some people, 
want something? Like, what's the difference between being interested and being committed? Being interested is I desire something, if it's convenient, but I'm committed to it, meaning no excuses. I'm too afraid to miss out. I'm going to trample every excuse. <laughs> I'm going to give the excuse a black eye, as Al-Maghrib says, right? He says, number one, you have to, there's a desire for it. Number two, there has to be a fear of missing out on it. And number three, there has to be pursuit of it. How do you know you desire it and you fear missing out on it? That you're actually working. There has to be work. And he says there is no way around this equation. Don't lie to yourself, he's saying. And get, let's get to work. And then from there, he goes on back to point one, knowing the details, the details of the best and worst outcomes for about uh, two-thirds, maybe, of the remainder of the book. Uh, and inshallah, if Allah permits, we will work at them, these dozens of harms of sins and disobedience, one by one, inshallah ta'ala, in the coming weeks. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik, shadu an la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Jazakallahu khayran.